have several in review because I, just as these images, I have so much content um, to try to express about them. This was that um, image of Mars, Aries, uh, probably a Roman statue that copies a Greek one. <clears throat> and for people not in the first series on the gods, um, this may or may not be familiar information. And that is about these men's bodies. There was a wonderful article I once read that just summarizes that's called nudity as a costume. That Greek men in the period of this, which is fifth century Greek originally probably, uh, <clears throat> were only in the nude younger men when they're exercising as you might imagine with those voluminous yards of cloth around them, it'd be pretty hard to do much exercising. <clears throat> but um, the, the bodies in the classical Greek way of thinking was not just your organic self, but it was an um, expression of your um, moral ver uh, qualities, of your intellectual standing, of your wealth. Because looking around, it would have made great sense if the, you're looking at a population where the number of people who are slaves, <clears throat> who started work when they were youths and generally doing repetitive work, there was a lot more physical deformation and they also didn't have the same diet. Um, said their bodies tended not to be so splendid as especially men who were free to exercise. Now, women are completely out of the conversation. They're, the, they're just not involved. <clears throat> so when you see one of these handsome uh, figures, you are to see not just a man with a fine physique, but you're seeing someone who's at the top in every possible way. So this was a sort of the Paragon uh, model held up for you. And then you add on to that another layer of meaning. When we look at this one where the Emperor Hadrian's sculptors seem to have used that Aries Borghese as a model to do this um, marriage portrait of Hadrian and his wife, Sabina, in which Hadrian is presenting tremendous amount of his um, uh, justification for rule and essentially propaganda, if you don't think of that as being falsehood, uh, propaganda for his rule. Because of course, um, the rate of literacy was lower and uh, imagery carried just like even the images on coins carried a lot of content from the government to the people. So here, when Hadrian uses this, it is partly he's showing his agenda, which is to make Rome as great as Greece was at its greatest period and a time of under Pericles in the fifth century. So that's why he's got a fifth century Greek ideal for a body here. And he is also sort of putting forward the claim that he himself is a god. Now, Hadrian was not at all military, but <clears throat> with the Roman concept that um, the god Mars was essential god of the Romans, and he was actually the mythical father of one of the two strains of the founding myth of, of Rome. Um, he's showing himself as sort of like the the God who's the founder of the state, the protector of the state. And uh, then Sabina, she would rep represent all the virtues present in the Venus, which are secondary. In Canova, in the early 19th century, and Napoleon certainly understood that was what those Roman messages were in a statue like the Hadrian. So the Vincanova uses a, also a Greek figure 
to support the portrait head of Napoleon. This is Napoleon as peacemaker, supposedly. Uh, you have that now, now Napoleon is as great as the Greeks, as great as the Romans. Um, of course, he's conquered both of them and he's holding out the apple, uh, what's the, the globe of the world with the victory of Pisa. Now, um, like the statue of Hadrian, it is just the head is the only other thing here that tells you who this is meant to be. So there you have <clears throat> Napoleon's essentially came as court painter, but a man involved with him from the time of the revolution on. Jacques-Louis David and his portrait of Napoleon as the general in his study. So look how, you know, that is truly body as costume. That is simply a message supporting a head. So now we go where I stopped last time was um, now in this series of Venus and Mars. So it's going to be much more uh, significant as shortly in, in this um, presentation today. But you remember that Venus was not married to Mars. She was married to the blacksmith god, Hephaestus, or in Latin, Vulcan. But she had an affair, which becomes a scandalous affair and a source of much art and much literature, um, with Mars. And then we have always then, uh, when these two figures are together, a whole range of possible allegorical meanings. Uh, they're, they're not in, when it's just the two of them, and here was the child Venus, I mean, child Cupid, um, there's nothing about that illicit romance. These are, um, well, there's just, you can put them up almost with anything. So, so Venus represents peace. Um, she represents um, all the bounty of the physical world. And Mars is of course the turbulent warlike God or, <clears throat> so you, you can have this mean that only through, I mean, it's like a lot of political messages you might hear now, only through having a strong military can you preserve peace for the women and children. Or you can have it that only the women and children can control the rampant militarism or only, and only a good society equally balances the two of them. And that's the value of just working with this figures as simple as allegory. You read in whatever allegory you want. And to Rubens, and I'll show you several of Rubens, we've got a lot of Rubens today. This was enormously important. Uh, <clears throat> I've lectured on Rubens before, but not in part of this series. So uh, Rubens' father had been involved in politics and um, his family had been banished for a while because his father had an affair with the wife of the ruler at the, at the, of the area in Flanders where they lived. But then <clears throat> they were invited back in. But, but uh, Rubens, through most of his career, uh, was this prolific painter with a huge workshop, um, helped him carry out a range of commissions. But he was uh, often worked for um, the top echelons. He worked for rulers in Mantua in Italy. And then he worked, uh, did a great deal for Philip IV, King of Spain. And he also worked for Charles I in England. And he worked for the local ruler in Flanders in Antwerp, which is where he was raised. The, uh, <clears throat> and this is the time of the 30 years war, early 17th century, when Europe was just riven by war. Uh, and there was also a plague during this period. So uh, it's a time when there was the conflict. It ultimately settles out in the kind of nation states we know now, the territories of 
but it was a conflict between the areas that we still think of as essentially Roman Catholic and the areas where the Protestants um, then took power. Um, the, the more democratic government or representative government in Holland, as opposed to the monarchical government in the other countries, just the, all of the dynamics got shifted out in this warfare. And so Rubens, as he painted for Spain and England, who were two chief competitors, um, both meddling in the affairs of the lowlands of Holland and now we'd say Flanders, <clears throat> Rubens was an active diplomat, carrying messages from one to the other, and was, was not only carrying messages, but was actually um, able to um, do some independent negotiations. Now, he's not the first painter who was used that way. Um, Jan van Eyck had been doing that more than a century and a half before. But so when Rubens does several paintings of these Mars and Venus. They fit into his struggle for peace, which he longed for. Not only had his family suffered, but he came from Antwerp, which because that their um, port had been blockaded, there was a, just a devastating starvation there. So <clears throat> he knew firsthand the privations that, that came with war. So he does these paintings that we know because of who they went to, that they were to carry messages. This painting, which is uh, looks a little bit strange now because the little Cupid looks like he's struggling mightily to stay in his mother's lap. Um, it's actually because some of the paint has come off. He was a little bit more securely placed originally. Um, here you have a rather adoring Mars. Um, and then here she is, that, that gesture again of expressing milk, which is the, the idea of the bounty of nature that she represents so that the children are fed, so that the women and the children are safe. Um, so this is, this is the value of peace. And this was the painting that was sent, to, well, sent, probably intended for, um, a member of the nobility in Spain. And it probably commemorates the diplomatic entente that Rubens was able to negotiate between Spain and England. Because there's another painting, a slightly different subject. Much grander which Rubens had made, given as a present to King Charles I of England when it was time after these peace negotiations for uh, Rubens to leave and go back to Flanders. And this woman, now it, she's not Venus, she represents peace, but it's that same figure. And you see, he's just taken the drawing and that motif. And the idea is somewhat also related because this is, Minerva, so that's Athena, the goddess of wisdom and war, and she's banishing Mars. Now, those were the two gods involved with war, but you remember that since, especially among the Greeks, that war and Mars were unruly, unbridled passion, war is devastation. And Minerva was the goddess of war as strategy and planning and cunning and with aims of peace ultimately. So that kind of war, this kind of unbridled warfare, the violence is being driven out so that there will be peace. And peace is represented here by these children, um, uh, Seder here and all the bounty of the crops and these dancing menads and playing music back here and the, the Cupid. So, <clears throat> This is, this is, he's saying, this is what is now possible because war has been driven out of war. But it's being said obliquely in a way that can be hung on a wall. And if you don't want to get the message, you don't have to get the message. It doesn't have to have a particular current 
implication. Here's another one Rubens did, and I just frustrated. I couldn't find any information about this. Is it? Uh, it's in a small museum in Genoa. Why, the reason I want to know is I just almost positive it. This is a portrait of someone. Here uh, in the guise of Mars. I think this, this face is still so idealized. I don't know if this is meant to be a, a wedding portrait among other things or not. Uh, certainly this is Bacchus the god, or Dionysus, the god of wine. Um, and so that's one of the other kinds of um, prosperity and good life security of uh, now you can enjoy yourself after this. So this is, this is, a, but this, he's so self-conscious here. And there were a number of artists who, who would, um, oh, I'd say it's more like patrons would say, show me as ex-god or ex-goddess. And, you know, they, they sort of had to sort of chopped up their pride that way. And then just the peculiarity I came across <clears throat> to say how, how relevant these paintings are now as paintings. This is a contemporary English woman who does her own versions of, of um, old masters. And there it is. And she's now working with a sort of an abstract expressionist style, but still this is under there. And she's just got a whole lot of paintings like that. That's updating it just as art. And one more that Rubens did here, uh, as he did so often, he, he's uh, collaborating with someone else. This is with the, the Peter Bruegel that we know from that painting of August that's in the Met. This is his son, Jan Bruegel the Younger, who was um, famed especially for doing still lifes, um, just um, all the sort of genre subject matter like this. So this is again, now this is Venus disarming. Well, it's actually Cupid who's doing the actual disarming. Mars, who she's gazing into his eyes and removing his helmet. And you can see Cupid is tugging off his weaponry and Mars is incapable of doing anything to defend himself. But there's such a pile of weaponry back here and a cannon, contemporary cannon. And there is the forge of Vulcan or Hephaestus, who's actually her husband. And the forge is still active. So this carries a different message. It really suggests that peace is a passing thing. That war is always lurking. And he did this later when in fact that piece was beginning to disintegrate. No one can do lustrous eyes, buxom nudes like Rubens. And then, oh my. I, I, when I look at these 19th century versions of it, you can see how purely like academic exercises, how thoroughly they are imitating without inner understanding <clears throat> the works of antiquity. This is again by David, who did that portrait of Napoleon. Um, David did this when he, I suppose Napoleon too, were in exile. David was in exile in Brussels, this painting's 10 feet high. And he started this when he was 72. So just kind of like, that enough is pretty awesome. But so, so you have um, Venus now, she's going to crown Mars who's lounging here with her crown of roses, it seems. And he already, instead of having a baldric, has, has flowers here. So he's, he's thoroughly succumbed to the pleasures of beauty. She's accompanied by the three muses and here Cupid. Um, the figures in here were quite well known. I'm not, I can remember some of them. Uh, she, she, 
she was a member of the Brussels Opera Company. And this man was a, quite a devotee of the opera. This face down here is, the ba is based on a ballet star who was related to Marius Petrova of the Russian ballet. And one of these three women, I'd assume it's this one, was the mistress of the Prince of Orange, the ruler in, in Belgium at that time. So he's just as kind of what had done, placing portraits of people, but now not from the realm of government, but from, from theater in this very theatrical presentation. Look at that coy way he looks right out at you. All right, now we get to Hephaestus or Vulcan. And I'm, I'll probably go back and forth. With them. I never know which one to call which. <clears throat> uh, give you a little of his myth while you're looking at an image. This is a Roman bronze statuette. It's only about 10 inches high. It's in a, a museum in Kansas City. Uh, it's, may be a copy of a Greek one, you never quite are sure. So the story of Hephaestus, he, he was the son of, now well, there's slightly varying myths about him, but he probably was the son of um, Jupiter and um, Juno or, well, I'll, I'll leave it there, we'll, we'll stay with the Roman names. And when he was born, he was in some way, um, I guess, some of it's just that he was ugly. Anyway, his mother rejected him. Uh, this is the one version of it. And she threw him to the, to the earth off Mount Olympus. And he was crippled in the fall. The other version is that he was crippled when he was thrown to earth when Jupiter at some time uh, wanted to sleep with his wife and um, the god Vulcan got in the way uh, to protect his mother. And so he was thrown to the ground. So he was, um, he always had this deformity. And although this figure does not present him as deformed, there's something that is of note right away is that you see his dress. And this costume is, is a Greek workman's costume. Uh, it's just a one sleeve here slipped off is the kind of way you often see figures. Um, even, even Jesus, when he's shown as the good shepherd, wears this costume. This is peasant costume or workman's clothing because he doesn't have a body that is to be revealed. Well, so he, what, what is he the God of? Well, he's, he's an invaluable God and he's a wily God and he's an important God. He's also the God of volcanoes. Um, so he's the blacksmith god. And his symbols sometimes are, he has a, a, um, a hammer and tongs, and sometimes there's an, there's an anvil near there. So he's, he's the metal worker. He's the god of all craftsmen, um, architects, painters, sculptors. Uh, he was extremely valuable to the other gods. He produced all their thrones. He made the chariot for the sun god, Apollo, Helios. He made the winged sandals for Mercury. Uh, he made Cupid's bows and arrows. He made Aphrodite's girdle. Uh, he did something that human beings have suffered from. He made, at the god's request, the woman Pandora, who had the box that when opened, had all of the world's ills in it that have been spilled out into human life ever, his, ever since then. Um, and then the other part of this myth is um, there's, he, he landed on an island called Lemnos, and I'll show you one painting related to that. <clears throat> but he's also in the ancient world associated wherever there's a volcano, they say, uh, Vulcan has his forge underneath, because that's the flames of his, of the forge showing up. Here's another pretty mediocre Roman version of it. And then I thought, 
we always want to keep these things up to date. Well, we'll just ignore this rather splendidly posed man down here. Look here. This is a 56 foot high statue in cast iron of Vulcan, which is in Birmingham, Alabama, um, in Vulcan Park. Uh, <clears throat> part of it was made, the, the sections for this to be cast were made in uh, Passaic and then shipped down by, by railroad to Alabama where it was assembled. The head alone weighs 11,000 pounds. I mean, it, what was this all about? Well, Birmingham commissioned this for the World's Fair in 1904 in St. Louis to celebrate Birmingham's founding and its importance as a place of iron working. Uh, both of, um, there was a lot of mining around here and then there was a lot of smelting and actual iron work. So that's what this was created for. So those are my three statues I have for you, the God. So there's something else left from the Greek world that's linked with him, but alas, it's not a statue for us. Uh, this is the, uh, you're looking at the aerial view down into the area just below the Acropolis in Athens called the Agora. And I have to just sort of smirk and boast that uh, for about a year and a half, I worked in a building that's right over in here um, doing research. But this is a temple to the god Hephaestus and Athena, because Athena also worked with crafts, not more women's crafts, more weaving and um, so there were large statues in bronze of both of them in here. This is of the middle of the fifth century. This is the best surviving of any Doric Greek temple. If you go there, even some of the original sculpture survives on the outside. So what I have from Greece to show is just a couple of details from the many Greek pots that um, illustrate him. Uh, this is one from a sixth century pot that was just a small strip on the pot. This comes from um, over on the coast of Turkey, the pot does. And he doesn't have his attributes here. He's not caring. But you see how they're showing that he's lame by the show his feet reversed. And this is a story, a beloved story, and I'll show you an, another, another, maybe two versions of it. So Hephaestus, after he landed on the, on the island of Lemnos, as you can imagine, was an enormous sulk at the gods, but he's wily. And one of the things he did was to create these thrones and he created a throne for his mother, um, which she was very gratified to receive. But when she sat, she sat down in it, clamps sprang out on it. So she was trapped on her throne. And she pleaded with him and he would not um, release it. The other gods pleaded, pleased to release her from the throne. He wouldn't. The only God that he was willing to listen to was Dionysus, the God of wine. And that's what's being represented here, this great big wine cup. And these are followers of that God. And Dionysus got him so drunk that he was able to get him back up uh, on, onto Mount Olympus. So these are the followers that when you see him here, now you see again, he has his foot backwards. Um, when you see a woman dancing like this, and this is a satyr, you see his ears here, and this woman dancing. These are the, the companions of Dionysus in their revelry and their in this procession. So he's and now he's he's carrying his uh, sort of his well here it looks more like a hatchet for the forge. He's he's on his trip back to Mount Olympus. And here he is too. He's being lured forward. Here's a god Dionysus holding the cup. <laughs> so he's staring at it intently and he's being pulled around. And I'll show you this on the 
on the other side. So here's Juno, we're going to call her even though this is Lee, sitting trapped on that throne. Uh, <clears throat> here's her daughter Hebe keeping her cool because she just can't do anything as this procession is coming along. So I've only one painting to show you related to that and it's because I'm gonna take a little side trip with you. Um, this is by the uh, extraordinary, extraordinary strange artist named Piero di Cosimo. And there are um, three paintings of his in the Met uh, that are worth looking at. If you're very familiar with much Italian Renaissance art or even you think back to the Botticelli, Mars and Venus we saw last time. This has a kind of similar, kind of very precise lines around it. And even the faces are a little bit like that. Uh, Piero di Cosimo was also from Florence and uh, he was like a younger contemporary of Leonardo. So here he shows nymphs who are rescuing the young Hephaestus. It's really here by the angle of his arm and perhaps by the awkwardness of his pose to get the idea that he's, he's suffered in some physical way. But I want to talk about this artist just a bit and then um, because I do want you to go see the painting. So here's this one detail. Strangely human, aren't they? Where's that ethereal beauty you find in Botticelli? This is very square jawed woman here who looks extremely specific. Marvelous lots of detail. Wonderful woolly little lamb here. Looks more like a lap dog. I uh, brought this in so that I could tell you what the uh, contemporary said about the painter, Piero di Cosimo. Because I, I, upon reading this, I was like, goodness. Uh, to me, it just it describes some of that I would say in sort of modern pop psychology, we'd say he's somewhere on the autism spectrum. Because this is what said about him. If Piero had not been so abstracted and had paid more heed to himself in his life, than he did, he would have won recognition for the great talent he possessed. Whereas through his brutish ways, he would be, was rather held to be a madman. He changed his style from almost one work to another. Uh, he refused to let anyone clean his house and he subsisted on eggs, which he cooked 50 at a time. Um, he could not stand babies crying, men coughing, bells ringing or friars chanting. And he doted on animals and he was Successful as a designer, especially of processions and theatrical productions. So that kind of social awkwardness and that um, dis intense discomfort with sounds and just going his own way is, is what made me think, ah, I know people who are somewhat like this. So let me show you the one. So he, he did have one patron who was stood by him, but his, he, he, he doesn't follow conventional presentations or understandings. Here, I, we, I'd flip right past this last time. Here was his version of Mars and uh, Venus that was so much like Botticelli's, but look at these people. Those no more look like they come from a distant realm of the gods. Those look like live models who have posed for him. I have one, I'll take it to the face here. Yeah. See, what? A, different uh, imaginative realm than that. And spying the baby from such an unusual angle. Is that the heroic God? So this is one of the three that's at the Met. He did a, a several paintings there in other museums as well, where he, he follows a kind of a different source than most um, poets, thinkers, and painters did about the beginning of time. 
And he saw the beginning of time when people were brutish. Uh, They're really subhuman. And uh, so this is, here they are on a hunch, these guys. Odd creatures and fire breaking out back here. They're worth looking in great detail. Or this is another one there. Tremendous fantasies. Look at this up here. Or this arch. And then this one he did of the young St. John the Baptist, which is at the museum. Oh, I think this is just marvelous myself. Look at that tender, vulnerable mouth. Don't you think he had one particular person posing for him for that? I mean, I don't want to diminish the sense of the tremendous imaginative capacity, but at some place he's looked at someone who's quite vulnerable and shown him there. Okay, so that's the excursion. And then to the myth that then I'm going to show you in some greater detail. And that's, it's in, uh, it was so popular. There were, um, Ovid wrote about it um, in the Iliad. It uh, occurs in, um, I guess not Ovid, <laughs> Homer. And then Ovid wrote about it and there are medieval romances, like this is a medieval romance on it. Um, that tells of that this great story when Mars and Venus uh, are sleeping together. I'll tell you the story because it's just one moment in the story. And um, cuckolding Vulcan. Um, Mars has um, generally gets away before dawn. He's, he's, he actually has someone, I don't know, some semi mortars minor deity um, that he's, he's essentially bribed saying, you know, tell, be sure I'm awake before dawn so I can get away so Vulcan doesn't catch us, doesn't see us. Well, <clears throat> one night this, this guard slept. So the rising sun, that would be Apollo or Helios, saw the two of them in bed went rushing back up um, to Mount Olympus and told the rest of the gods. Oh, no, I'm getting ahead of the story. So he then went and told Vulcan. So Vulcan, crafty Vulcan, planned his revenge. He created a fine chain or mesh, a variation in the story. And he draped it from the bedposts. So that when the two then slept together, he arranged for it to fall down on them. And they were so trapped that they could not move. So at that point, Vulcan goes back up to the rest of the gods and he invites them all to come down and see what, his humiliation, to see what Mars has done. Well, the, the goddesses are too modest, they don't come, but uh, Neptune, Mercury, and I guess it's Apollo, they come back and, and watch. <clears throat> and this is based on a, a, a 13th century romance that's sort of based on that. This manuscript is actually from the early 16th century for King Francis I of, of France, who was at this time, um, had also invited Leonardo to live with him at court. So just think how different Leonardo's imagery is from what this manuscript of the Romance of the Rose um, that was made for the, for the king. But it, it, it uh, has all this wonderful small detail that you could enjoy when you're looking at, you know, like this, at a manuscript that you'd come back to again and again. Now it takes place in that medieval town. And here's our God. He's not shown as being maimed in any way here, but with his anvil. And this is the ties the mattress to the bed. You don't actually see a chain. But, um, Venus has her nightcap on and here you see her mirror and a little bedside book. And Aries, whose hair is kind of standing on end. He is evidently put on pegs up here, his armor and his helmet. 
And here it's like three village maidens that are coming in and laughing, just mocking this scene. So I'm, show, I'm going to show you three from the first half of the 16th century. They're so different, like chalk and cheese. <clears throat> this is a Flemish tapestry made for a cathedral in Portugal. Um, and it's for being made for a cathedral for this religious context may account for its uh, far more sedate presentation where they are clothed and just seated actually as if they were camping with this great canopy outside in this marvelously lush landscape is so typical of those Flemish uh, tapestries. The part of this, and here's the, there's Vulcan and he has the chain and he's pulling them tight. This is, um, this story also appeared in the Metamorphoses by Ovid, which you wouldn't expect because the metaphor, metamorphoses are about changes, um, essentially, mainly the myths of human beings changing into some other creature. Well, it is that what Mars did to that sentinel who was such an absolute failure as a sentinel that reduced him to the being an object of ridicule among the other gods, that Mars turned that sentinel into the rooster. So that's why we have the rooster crowing early in the morning where or what he was supposed to be doing was notifying uh, Mars that daylight was coming. So how could this have been used in a church? Well, the speculation well, it wasn't in the church itself, it was in the church property, is that this would be um, a moral about um, the necess necessity of good behavior, of obeying your vows, of avoiding blandishments, of um, secular love, maybe. I'm sure any priest, anybody would employ a, a good and largely amusing story like this. And then around 1550, here's the Venetian painter Tintoretto does this as well. And I'll show you a couple of sketches for it. So he, he, he works on canvas and he paints in a really, really loose way as I will show you in detail. So this is Vulcan. And here's Venus, not looking like she's particularly welcoming his advances. Her, their uh, little child, Cupid, asleep back here. And I will show you that detail. This is a table. Well, and you may see something down here. It's kind of dark. That's Mars. He's hiding under the table. He's halfway through his getaway. So maybe Vulcan will be so distracted by his wife that he's able to sneak out. He, Vulcan is not aware of the dog barking furiously at this interloper under the bed. This here is the shield of Mars on the back wall, <clears throat> which is so finely polished that you see the back of Vulcan and her in her bed right there. That's the sketch, and you see he hasn't really worked out putting Mars here yet, or even thinking about the Cupid. Just, but he did have this scene from the back and the position of the two of them. One detail, look at this. The Venetians are famous, especially Tintoretto, <clears throat> for this really broad, swift brushwork, just dazzled others. They could do because it was oil paint. The same thing here in the sleeping cupid. So you see, when you paint it on canvas, you put a dark layer of paint underneath and then you paint it up on top. And there are whole areas where there's just not any paint applied. This is just the darkness of the canvas that he uses them like shadows. This is a, that's 
1600 by an artist named Sarah Cheney. And it's not really, I mean, if I were being strictly operating as an ought to, there's no Hephaestus in this. <laughs> but there, there, I'm just curious as all get out there, right around 1600, there's just a spate of paintings about with this story. So I wonder if there was um, a play or an opera or some poetry that was um, kind of spurred an interest around that time. Uh, this is a painting of copper and it's only about, well, not even a foot and a half high. Now, copper was just a, is a very special medium and it was reserved for small paintings because copper that kind of roughed up the surface and then they put a layer of paint on it. And then when you applied your oil paint to it, you could work in infinitely tiny detail. And the colors, which you can't see in these reproductions, are said to be, they glow almost like the colors of enamels. They have a kind of a, so the, the richness of the color and extraordinary detail and the small size, they're almost closer to being like looking at manuscript pages. And they invite really, really close looking, just, just the opposite of the Tintoretto. And that Sarah Cheney is taking all advantage of that look, even in the architecture. You know, all the detail up here in this carved frieze along this room. And this is supposedly Vulcan's palace. And it goes way, way back in space here. It's kind of plays around with the idea of space too. But here is a couple in all their disordered bedclothes. And here's, of course, Cupid, but they have all these other little cherubs playing in the bedclothes too. And they sort of suggest they, in their haste to get in bed, they've just thrown things every helter skelter way. And then I got to show you a, a, a detail right here, because this is definitely playing with a comic element. Cupid, you see, is peeing on this while he's admiring himself in the shield. So that's for some very wealthy person's delight. This one, much more history on it. But it's also on copper, and it's, this is only eight by six inches. Uh, it's at the Getty Museum in California. Uh, it's by a Dutch painter. Uh, so here you have this enraged uh, Vulcan coming up in on the couple who are still completely absorbed in each other. And the Cupid is then hiding under the bed with the sword here. No, excuse me, that one I just showed you this, that was 11 by 18. This is the one that's in the Getty that's eight by six. This is even more like, what? <laughs> that's only eight inches high? He did a number of versions. He did lots of big paintings. Curiously, in his big paintings, there are only a few people. But so he, he, he this one's got almost a dozen figures in here. Um, so this, these would almost invite looking at with a magnifying lens, this, this kind of. Extraordinary, but look here, there at the bedside table. Here's his cast off armor. And here comes, here's Vulcan. This is the later, he, he did a couple of versions of this. this. So this is a later moment when the gods have been invited to come down. And actually here's Diana, the goddess has come as well, as Apollo. So they're coming in to laugh. And in one version of the story, the gods say, no, they'd be happy to replace that, you know, take Mars place here. And this is a little three and a half inch high, three and a half inch wide um, gilded plaque that's in the map uh, that has that story too. So these are very precious objects. They're meant for this to be precious detail. What this plaque was used for, what it was placed on, I don't have any idea. So 
that you see in the course of the year. Here's poor melancholy Vulcan. Then to shift the mood of it completely at the artist, the very great artist, Velasquez. He did three paintings um, in his career working, I believe all of them were done for um, King Philip in, in Spain, <clears throat> where they're, they're, they can be sort of tied with this myth. Um, they're splendid paintings and they have, a, a quality that's evidently both Velasquez and typical of what was um, the court atmosphere, the kind of um, probity and restraint <laughs> um, that was expected in the Spanish, especially by the Spanish clergy. So um, this one, is, uh, let me give you the size because it's big. It's about um, seven by 10 feet and it's in the Prado now. So this is when uh, the god Apollo comes to Hephaestus and alerts him to the hanky pankies that his wife is up to. So here is Apollo working at the forge and ironically enough, what he's doing is creating armor for Mars here. In the stories, there are the mention actually by name of the three assistants. So I, I have some details. So all that kind of um, amusing quality is gone. This is now has such a quality of, of majesty and depth in it. It's a very young God Apollo. Just radiant youth. And he's just telling, he's not tattling. In the wiry, lean, old Vulcan, as he takes in the news. It's left to this young fellow, gaping mouth, astonished at the story. So that's a quality of humanity that the others don't have. And the meaning of this Mars he did a few years later, this is another big painting. This is about six feet high and also in the Prado. Um, this was, went in the King's hunting lodge and it was with two portraits of philosophers. So it's like, what, what's Mars doing with philosophers? Because this is a strange painting. Now here's Mars weaponry and you have all the disordered bedclothes and he's just there. Now, so there's no specific story the presence of the armor like this, it's often, um, it's like a cliche, you know, it's love disarms aggression, Venus disarms war. Maybe this is the humiliated Mars after uh, Vulcan has agreed to release them. Here's the head. Lost in shadow, he's lost in thought. Now I know that the Spanish court um, enjoyed having paintings as meaning was either multiple uh, meanings or meanings that were a little bit elusive as a source of conversation. You know, they would have learned conversations about them. This would certainly lend itself to that. And here's the Venus he did. It's called the Rokeby Venus. She's in the London National Gallery. Now see, um, in the Spanish collection, there was also, well, this is actually Rubens copy of one by Titian that the Spaniards owed that was 
like the one I showed you last time, biotition of, of Venus looking in the mirror. But you see how this, so that was an Italian version. But this is specifically, although you have the satin against the flesh with it, where are the pearls, you know, where's the furs? This is a, again, a, a more restrained scene. Um, and in this one, also just as in the Titian, it, there's no way she could be, that's not, she could, she's not looking at herself. This reflects, she would be looking out at whoever has come into the room. That's what Monet picks up on, on in scenes like this. <clears throat> okay, so that's an excursion on another artist. And one final one, this is by Boucher in the middle of the um, 18th century. Uh, also quite large painting. Uh, it's in the Wallace Collection in London. There's, a, there's three, I'll show you two of the three. And they were probably meant to go maybe in a boudoir or some private room of, a, of someone. So here, here's Vulcan, who's discovered the gods. This great play, of course, 18th century eroticism rampant in here. This great gold satin cloth over them. And then the other one, which I'm, hmm, is to tell you what's coming next class almost. Uh, this is a, I'm sorry that it's so dark, a, a subject that is so popular forever. And I'm, next time we'll take it up even through Cezanne. And that's the judgment of Paris. It's a story again that involves Venus. Um, I'll give you one more painting to tell you the story that's the genesis of all of this. This is a painting by by younger contemporary of Rubinson based on an oil sketch by Rubinson. <clears throat> there had been a banquet of the gods to celebrate the marriage between a sea nymph named Thetis and a man who got into innumerable scrapes named Peleus. They, they're ultimately the parents of uh, Achilles, the hero Achilles. But all the gods are invited to this feast, except one goddess, the goddess of discord. Well, who would want her at a feast? But what she does as revenge is that she tosses onto the table a golden ball, apple, that is inscribed to the fairest. And three goddesses all claim it for themselves. Venus as the fairest, Minerva, Athena, and Juno. Well, Jupiter is not gonna intervene in this battle. How's he gonna choose which of these three women uh, is going to get it? So Jupiter fobs this off on a young sh hapless shepherd who lives in um, now off the coast of Turkey and named um, Paris, who is the, um, was the, how is it? He was the son of the king of Troy, Priam, but he had been banished, thrown out, left abandoned when he was a child because of the prophecy that he was gonna bring about the fall of his city. Well, anyway, of course that's gonna ultimately happen because then the, God, the young man, Paris, is gonna to have to choose which of these goddesses gets it. Aphrodite is gonna get it. And in revenge, Athena is going to declare the destru destruction of Troy should come. It's the beginning of the story of the Trojan War. So it's an important, important story. And that's what we'll work with next time. And you have now, I know, either to go to uh, look at movie musicals or 
always, I'll stay on for a while, um, answer questions or look at anything you've got in the chat. I will get myself, well, I sort of hate to stop sharing things that are just gorgeous. Oh, that's not gonna work. Maggie? Yeah. Um, there was a picture you showed near the middle of, of the lecture where you said that Vulcan wasn't present. It was a picture. Yes, in, yes, that one where, where, where Cupid is peeing on the, in, the, in the metal. Yes. But I did see Vulcan hiding under the curtain. At least I think it was Vulcan. I'm, I, I imagine you're right. I will go look at it again. I will do my peering at it close up. Thank okay, you. and also um, the, the very first slide you showed, it yeah. maybe it was cracks, I don't know, but it looked like the sleeves and the ankles, there was something that, that looked like tights and... and um... He did have a band around his ankle. That is original. The rest is, is where it's been put back together. So that's because sometimes he's shown with that as a kind of a reminder of his affair with, with uh, is a, a subsidiary ID for him. Also his, around the wrist. Aphrodite. What? Also around his wrist. It looked like he was probably wearing clothes even though he was nude. That would hold his uh, the band for his shield. See the, the wristband that would hold the shield in place. Good looking. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? I see there is some chat here. Uh, whether David Yates paintings were political center, well, um, I don't know. I know originally, you know, he was such an ardent supporter. So I don't know by the end. Like the one in, in the Met where he's drinking Hemlock. Yeah, Socrates, yeah. Yeah, that's that's supposed to be um, political satire, I think. Um, I think anyway, <laughs> that's what I was told. Yeah, good question. Okay. Any more? Oh, shucks. Okay, well, so you know what you're going to get next week. Goodbye. Thank you.